Uh, welcome all of you to San Francisco. And the idea is to uh, rethink about um, you know, what the future of finan the financial services industry is going to look like, uh, especially uh, right now that the agenda of um, AI, um, generative AI, uh, has been put onto the pl platform. Now, this book that I've written, I, I, I took many years to write this book. And for those of you who are here as part of the Silicon Valley um, Innovation Tour, um, there are some things that I noticed from the tour that I want to incorporate uh, into the discussion in this book because uh, there are some topics that we weren't able to discuss uh, in a coherent manner. Um, in writing this book, um, and this is my, my first book, uh, you know, the funny thing is, I think it took about 15 years to write this book. And the reason is, I come from traditional banking, just like all of you. And I had to start thinking a lot about um, decentralized finance, the you know, crypto universe, blockchain, and all of those new technologies that are potentially changing financial services, um, and think about how traditional banking uh, is evolving in a linear fashion in itself. So for me, it's been a journey to try and incorporate, embody uh, the developments on both fronts. And if anything, this book is like a thinking or a thought uh, on the convergence between decentralized finance and traditional banking. And I also noticed from uh, the group that we have here today that some of you uh, are very uh, bent and very committed to taking financial services to the next level in the traditional sense. Um, and that you've not yet started thinking about decentralized finance. And some of you are probably thinking about decentralized finance, but we didn't have the chance to, um, to you know, discuss them. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that the foreword for this book uh, are, writ are written by two people whom I totally admire. They are my dearest friends. Uh, and one of them is Barney Frank, uh, the co-author of the Dot Frank Act. So you, you can't go any further than that in terms of uh, the authority with which uh, this book has been uh, you know, uh, built on and, and uh, received. So the thing about Bunny is that uh, being my friend, of course, writing, uh, writing a forward is uh, not, uh, not difficult. But we are both very honest friends with each other. So the things that he disagrees with, with me, um, you know, he, he puts it into the forward and he says, you know, I, um, I do think that we do need to reimagine how finance has to be regulated, but I disagree with Emmanuel on this at that point. And interestingly enough, as it turned out, Barney was a director of Signature Bank. Uh, and through Barney, I met uh, the CEO of uh, 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 Signature Bank, uh, Shay. And, um, and so I, I also know a little bit more about Signature Bank than most people. Um, the second person who wrote a, a, a forward for me was Richard Sander. And Richard Sander was, it was the um, originator, the creator of the interest rate derivatives market worldwide. I mean, he's such a beautiful man. He created one of the financial services, um, you know, most important uh, derivatives um, indi um, index and uh, trading platform. Uh, and then he went on to uh, create uh, the climate change, uh, the, the um, cap and trade climate bond market for the US, which has now become a global phenomenon and is being copied almost wholesale uh, in China uh, in the hope that uh, this will help to price uh, climate change and, and uh, enable countries to uh, build um, you know, capital market mechanisms to be able to fund uh, the climate change agenda. So these are two of the most brilliant men I know, and they are my friends, my personal friends. And what they have to say in the book about uh, what's been written uh, will give you an idea of uh, what, what the thoughts are and how it's been received. I um, released the book in New York uh, in October last year, and um, it, it has been received quite well, um, strangely enough, by the blockchain community more than anyone else at first. Uh, and then slowly it's becoming more mainstream. Let me um, go through with you uh, the key ideas in this book and uh, very happy to have discussions with you in terms of uh, what you think or you want to react 
violently. Now, the book that I've written is actually very universal. Uh, I'm, I'm dealing with everything, everywhere, all at once. Uh, sounds familiar, right? And um, so it's micro in, in that we're talking about technology. It's macro in that we're talking about uh, geopolitics, um, the end of the dollar as a, uh, as a cur currency, as a global reserve currency. And so today, for example, we see um, you know, all of the uh, other countries and other regions sort of trying to create different sets of blocks uh, to try and find alternatives to the dollar. Um, and then you, then you see the rise of the CBDCs, cryptocurrencies, and now generative AI. And generative AI, together with you in this, in this trip, uh, I've got a sense of where the focus is. Um, and in all of these areas, I've started to look deeper into the working mechanisms of each one of them to understand where it might be taking us. And I'll say this, my one line conclusion of CBDCs is that CBDCs are designed to fail. Uh, very simple, okay? Uh, okay, so, and I'll, I'll explain to you uh, why. Um, now, okay, so the thing is that, um, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that in order to understand some of these macro trends, we need to understand the news behind the news uh, to get a sense of uh, the working, uh, moving parts uh, in order to take a view that make, makes sense. So now, I, I've picked out a few themes from my book uh, that I would like to share with you today. Um, the first theme is actually the personalization of finance. It's actually part of the, head, the title that I see that finance will eventually become personalized. And what do I mean by personalized? Um, uh, that's why, uh, in order to explain that, I have the photo of an ice cube. And what is ice? It is something that used to be sawn out of the lakes in, you know, in up north in, in Boston and uh, in, the, in the Great Lakes in Norway and then put on horse-drawn carriages and taken to cities like New York and, and, uh, and San Francisco uh, before it reaches your gin and tonic or, or you know, whatever uses you have. And imagine what, what ice used to be. It was the most inefficient way to carry uh, something um, you know, in, uh, to, to its end use. Uh, and what is ice today? Refrigeration. Uh, it is how you want it, when you want it, um, and with all within your control. Now, so what made that difference? Uh, in ice technology, in the refrigeration technology, it was a chemical called CFC, chlorofluorocarbon. Uh, and what does CFC do? It absorbs heat uh, to the point that ice can, or rather water can, uh, can become ice. In the book, uh, the first part of the book, I spend a lot of time um, examining the philosophy of money the mechanics of money, the mechanics of uh, transferring value. I even look at uh, how uh, sunlight, sun, the, the energy of the sun uh, reaches out and creates life on Earth. Um, so you can, you can go in there and have a look uh, as to the elements that I'm, I'm, I'm uh, discussing. Now, the long story short, uh, the CFC of the personalization of finance depends on four uh, important ingredients. Uh, the first is identity. If we get identity technology right, uh, we can start to see the ability of the individual to handle his own transactions. Second, value. Uh, and that is, uh, like I said, in the story of how the sun's energy uh, you know, reaches the earth, um, is captured by chlorophyll, uh, eaten by animals, uh, and then we eat the animals. That's how the value of the sun's energy uh, is internalized. And guess what? There are no intermediaries in the transfer of that value. Uh, and the whole financial system is based on intermediaries today. So the question is, can you imagine a world where in finance, there are no intermediaries? Now, it is true that Bitcoin uh, has given us a model, a working model where there are no intermediaries. Uh, but interestingly, uh, because of its origins in that, you know, about six or so main players hoard Bitcoin 
uh, and in all of the other cryptocurrencies, uh, they take on a life of their own only because of venture capital and so on. There's a lot. There's still intermediation involved. Uh, you know, so the the, the pure um, promise of intermediation. We're still a few steps away from that. Um, verification, uh, the ability to not dispute a transaction. Uh, if we can master that technology or um, hone in on that technology, uh, we are yet another step closer towards the personalization of finance. And then the fourth is the ability to carry information um, in that transaction. The second theme that I have in my book is that the uh, world is moving from its platform orientations today to personalization. Uh, and this is something which, when I tested with a few of platform players here in Silicon Valley, uh, I had a lot of pushback, okay? And it's interesting how uh, some of the major platform players, Google, for example, um, do not believe that we will get to a world where uh, the platform industry will disintegrate to personalization. They, they truly believe that, um, that the platform industry has a long way to go. But when we see how the platform industry has evolved, the 1990s were the uh, original uh, origination of the platform industry, the early years, as it were. The 2000s were when uh, some of the major platforms that have become a part of our everyday lives today uh, became fully mature. So, you know, the social media platforms and so on. So we see that uh, we are in a process of transition and we need to keep this transition in our heads because nothing that is happening today uh, is a given. Um, that it, it is, uh, you know, it is uh, status quo or that the, that the technologies that are developing right now uh, will evolve as they, uh, you know, on the top of the technologies that we are familiar with. So one of the things that um, I learned from our uh, Silicon Valley tour is that in AI, uh, we need to keep our hands or our, keep our finger on uh, the foundational AI technologies that are being created and not the applications and not be, cre not be, um, you know, be overwhelmed by the number of applications that are being developed. So when, any morning that you check on your, on your computer, you will see um, 100 new uh, applications on AI. Um, you know, how to write an essay, how to, um, you know, write a love story, whatever, you know. Uh, that's not where the action is. The action is still uh, on the foundational layer, the ability for, um, the, uh, for the generative, um, um, the, the generative pre-trained um, models to, uh, to process the information uh, that is being generated or the access to the, to the data that they have or the, to the text that they have. Now, so uh, what does that, where does that leave us with financial services? Um, I, my company tracks all of the digital banks around the world uh, under a program called Tap Insights. Uh, we actually rank all the digital banks in the world uh, as to whether they are profitable uh, and whether uh, they are well-funded. Uh, and, uh, and whether they are able to onboard uh, the, ma the maximum number of customers. Uh, and something that we've dis uh, we are tracking is that the profitable ones are very interesting. There are only very few profitable uh, digital banks around the world. Um, and it is, um, um, it is a, you know, a, a normal thing for a banker to say, you know what, uh, we need to go digital, we need to be put on a platform, we need to onboard as many customers as possible, we need to win uh, the market share war. Uh, now, the real battle uh, in uh, financial services is uh, to figure, to actually to recreate products uh, on, uh, in the digital world. And I'll explain that uh, in a second. Uh, because if all you do is digitize, you're doing nothing more than automating what you already do today. And so if your uh, general business uh, is um, not successful for whatever reason, because you're not a dominant player in your marketplace, or your product sucks, you, you don't have a good brand name, all of that, just digitizing doesn't solve those problems. Um, and there's a big difference between industrialization of finance and digitization of finance. And a lot of bankers um, don't make that distinction and therefore all you're doing is industrializing what you already do. Okay, so 
Um, the, there are a few themes, sub-themes from this platform to personalization um, idea that I am building on. Uh, firstly, uh, the real demand in finance is not financial products. You know, bankers have a way of thinking that what people really want is a mortgage, but actually what people really want is a house, you know, uh, or that what people really want is a automobile loan, what they really want is a car, you know. So what farmers need is not a bank loan, they need the plants to grow, uh, you know, and, and from there uh, generate profitability. So we have, a, we have a habit of putting ourselves in the picture of what people need to do in their everyday life. So when, if we start by thinking that what people need is digital access, not financial services, and then they can figure out their way and find their way in the world, uh, then we have a better idea of how we can be relevant to, uh, to society, to our customer base. The second thing about the uh, platform era is that, and I'm the one person who's saying this anywhere in the world, financial inclusion is a lie. Okay, why? Because insofar as it is, uh, as, as financial inclusion means, onboarding thousands if not millions of customers and monetizing them, then you're not doing anything different from what traditional banking has always been doing. Uh, in, in other words, you're going to be monetizing uh, poor people as you are rich people because at the bank of every financial platform is a venture capitalist who needs to be, um, to, to be rewarded. Um, and the empirical evidence that I have to support that is that I've studied very carefully um, microfinance. And uh, the microfinance that originated with Grameen Bank in uh, Bangladesh, uh, very manual, six women in a village, put them together, interest rate is 28%, right? And today, uh, all of the financial inclusion platforms in Indonesia, in Brazil, uh, in parts of Africa, is still 28%. Okay, so it's not like uh, just by uh, you know in, uh, adding uh, financial inclusion that we have reduced the price, passed on the profit uh, or the, the safe cost savings to the customers, improved our credit profile. No, nope, we're still charging the same 28% as the manual processes have been uh, all along. So, um, you know, when we call a spade a spade, then we start being able to deal with what we need to achieve uh, in financial inclusion. Um, so, the overall theme is that platforms will become ubiquitous, ubiquitous but not necessarily uh, profitable. And uh, there is work in progress taking place in the personalization of finance. Now, the third theme that I have developed in my book is, that, is the financialization of everything, okay? Um, here, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, anything that can be digitized can be financialized. Now, in 2013, Jeff Emel of GE made his speech saying that GE's core business is not going to be uh, manufacturing anymore. And that, uh, that the core business will be all of the data generated from its manufacturing. So if you look at the GE balance sheet in the future, you will see that the asset in there is not uh, the inventory uh, or the income from the inventory, but the data that they generated, right? And now you see more and more businesses talking like that. Tesla says the same thing, which is that each Tesla car has something like a few a billion terabytes of, of uh, data being generated. Uh, and, and if that data can be monetized, uh, that becomes the business uh, of um, a company like, uh, of, uh, like Tesla. Now, and, and the, the same thing about uh, Bitcoin. Now, if anything that can be digitized can be financialized, anything that can be financialized can be personalized. Uh, just one thing, one other thing that I want to say about digitized is this, that uh, anything that can be digitized uh, can be theoretically financialized, but not everything will be financialized. And you'll find that um, something else I say about data is this, that um, data is usually described as, uh, as uh, oil, as the new oil. So I describe data in my book as vegetable, 
Um, if you have too much of it, uh, you know, it, it loses its value. If you have too little of it, you can't use it. If your data is too old, you can't use that. If it's too young, you can't use that. It just has to be at the right time in order for it to be uh, usable. So uh, there are certain things about data, or rather the, the character of data that we need to understand uh, as that evolves. Now, um, what's interesting is that entire economies are now going to be um, defined by data. The US uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis in 2013 started to uh, redefine what the economy uh, comprises uh, to in, in order to generate GDP uh, away from industrial manufacturing to more ephemeral uh, products. So they started to include entertainment, trademarks, um, um, you know, esoteric values, and so on. Uh, and as we go along, uh, the U.S. is going to be um, redefining other assets uh, as being part of what defines uh, GDP. Now, the, 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 the point there is that the U.S. GDP uh, is becoming esoteric, meaning that uh, when the U.S. GDP was 19 trillion, a lot of that was manufacturing uh, and, and productive assets. There is now talk that is not inconceivable that the U.S. GDP can become as large as 45 trillion uh, in the next 20 years. Uh, and a lot of that 45 trillion will be based on esoteric assets um, and a lot of it driven by data, markets, the financialization of data. Then the question is, what do countries uh, end up doing? Um, and so I say that debt becomes the economy, meaning that the ability to issue indeterminate debt uh, becomes the defining character of an economy. Um, and in order to issue indeterminate debt, uh, the idea is to, um, is to digitize the debt uh, and make it tradable globally uh, and make it investable as an asset class. Um, and so some of the ideas that I have about the, uh, the future of geopolitics um, and the future of finance especially is that, you know, we like to think, and all of us come from countries where you have regulators who have got roadmaps and, um, you know, and policies in place to be able to curate the process of what the future of finance will look like. Now, when you look at the last hundred years, Every new development in finance has been developed as a result of desperation, of crisis. Now, when you digitize, when you digitize uh, finance, what happens? And this at a local level, at a, at a bank level, um, it's something very serious to think about. Um, the more you digitize, you actually are creating a, uh, a characteristic about your business uh, and, a, and a set of risk issues uh, that you may not be able to handle. And we saw that exactly in the Silicon Valley Bank uh, episode, which was that because uh, banking in the US today is essentially digitized, it's, a, it's possible to um, extract billions of dollars in, in one um, you know, touch of a button. In fact, I remember when uh, Silicon Valley Bank went under uh, on the Monday, I, I read, I was looking at Bloomberg, and the Bloomberg journalist was looking for an angle to see, uh, to show, uh, you know, a bank run, which is, you know, thousands of people lining up to, uh, to withdraw their money. There was no bank run. There was only six people out in the front door of uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Okay. Now, the thing is that um, um, when we internalize that, we really need to come to terms with the fact that the more digitized any one of our businesses look like, uh, it has to make us think uh, that that business is now fundamentally different. So the deposit business, for example, uh, has moved from static deposits. And today, um, you find a whole range of deposits in, um, in uh, digital wallets, uh, which are an extension of your deposit account, to digital wallets which carry cryptocurrencies in them. So the digital wallet space uh, has redefined the deposit business, but many banks don't, are not even aware or are not uh, embracing that this is the revolution that they already have to face. And if the digital wallet business has 
revolutionized finance, what is the essence of deposits? Deposits are no longer um, a, a, an asset by which you create value or wealth. It's, uh, it's a utility. In other words, you are being evaluated as a bank or you will be evaluated as a bank based on how much access or digital access you give the customers to their everyday life. So that evolution will continue. So, so I'm saying to the banking industry that don't be in love with the industry that you think you are in. You really need to start thinking about the, the revolution that is already underway. So I say to um, um, you know, all of the players that I come across with that, think about the mortgage business. To be able to complete a mortgage today is something between three months and six months. You've got to get a lawyer, he's got to go and check out on all the encumbrances, um, and then you've got to go and um, um, get the documentation completed, and so on. What do you think the mortgage business will look like when the mortgage uh, registry or, the, or the, the, the land registry is totally digitized? Uh, and the data is available to any, any lawyers uh, that are in the marketplace. And today there are apps that actually standardize uh, the documentation that, that lawyers don't need to use anymore. <laughs> right? So we are all well on the way for the mortgage business to, be, um, to become a commodity uh, and to be transacted and completed uh, within a day or half a day. And what do you think the mortgage business will look like when a millennial or a, or a Gen Z uh, can just transact and flip property at the touch of a, of a, of a phone, right? So uh, these are, we are still a long way from getting there, but we are well on our way to getting there. And it's something that we need to think about. So for all of the key um, banking products, this is the time to start thinking how they're going to look like in the future. I have friends who run uh, trading platforms in, in Dubai, uh, in Singapore, and something I say to them uh, is that the peer-to-peer -peer platform industry is going to come back uh, because the original sin of the peer-to-peer -peer players was to try and suggest that you now don't need a bank, but if you come onto my platform, I can match borrower and lender investor and investee, but they ended up calling the products by the same name that the banks call them. They call them mortgages. They call them investments, right? Now, um, so what I'm saying to them is, with uh, a lot more generative AI being put into uh, the platforms themselves, uh, the, the data becomes the product. The conversation becomes the product. And so the best thing that any platform player can do is to enable your platforms to collect as much conversation as possible because in the conversation, you will find the product. Okay? Now, we can have a conversation there, but uh, that's where I think um, that, that, the, that the finance industry is heading uh, on, the, on the platform. Uh, payments. Uh, it's not just the payments, but the information on the payment and the network effect on the payment that, that makes it possible. You know, something we don't realize that the banking industry has actually transformed under our, our watch. We think that we are looking at the same industry. So the mass amateurization of finance means that the individual is get, taking more and more ownership and has more and more ability to, to transact. Uh, to complete these transactions and even compete with uh, institutional investors and so on, right? And we have a few uh, cases of individuals who try to short the market and so on. We discovered in this trip that because of the funding issue in, uh, in, in, in innovation in, in the Silicon Valley area, the AI players have taken a very cautious approach. They, they want to be close to the money, so their own applications are incremental in nature. That's true, okay? But we need to keep our eye uh, on the foundational layer because that's where the transformational changes are going to take place. And when they take place, they're going to rewrite how we, 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 we build our, our IT architecture. Given everything that's happening and, and the direction the industry is taking, to be honest, it's not difficult to guess the next financial crisis, okay? 
The first thing about the next financial crisis is it's not going to be based on any underlying asset. Okay, it, it, it is, in all likelihood, it is going to be based on something as ephemeral as perception. We already seen that. A tweet from Steve, um, Peter Thiel um, created an $80 billion run on Silicon Valley Bank. And no amount of liquidity, risk management, um, and uh, you know, um, all kinds of uh, balance sheet risk managements that you could have had in place could have survived that uh, $80 billion uh, run uh, in one day. Okay? So in, in that sense, the risks that are coming onto the financial services are ephemeral. In other words, they are not based on the underlying business anymore.